Welcome back, everyone. The topic of our next panel is Afghanistan and Central Asia, enhancing stability and security in the region. At this time, I ask you to please welcome your moderator, the diplomacy correspondent for National Public Radio, uh, Michelle Kellerman. <laughs> Well, I will my statement even more as a report what we are doing. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, and uh, thanks to the Wilson Center for having me. I've been covering U.S. foreign policy for over a decade, and I rely on analysis in places like this. And also, thank you to the OSCE. I had the honor of interviewing the uh, Secretary General recently about Ukraine and Russia, so it's nice to be here. Um, and we're going to turn our attention now from the situation in Ukraine, a crisis that no one would have predicted a couple of years ago to a conflict that has been with us for well over a decade, and that's Afghanistan. Um, people are calling this the beginning of the transformation decade in Afghanistan, but that, of course, implies a, a large international and sustained commitment to the country. But this is at a time when the U.S. is scaling back its presence there, perhaps a bit slower than originally planned, but scaling back nevertheless, and when there are so many other crises going on in the world. So let's uh, get our attention focused back on Afghanistan to see uh, what we can do to, to help make this the transformation decade. We're going to first hear um, about the regional context, and we're going to hear from the Deputy Foreign Minister of Kazakhstan, to my left here, he's Yerjan Ashikbaev. He's a career diplomat who served in Belgium, was tapped for this current job in 2013, and we're going to start off the conversation with him to hear about the regional concerns for Afghanistan and what the region can do to help integrate Afghanistan. Shall we start? Yes, please. So, good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, to Wilson Center, uh, personally, Congresswoman Harman, Secretary General Zanier and uh, uh, Serbian chairmanship for the proactive approach in uh, dealing with uh, the most accurate challenges of uh, OEC agenda uh, through open dialogue and actionable ideas. So uh, Kazakhstan is a strong supporter of the OEC and has special commitment to that organization. Uh, let me remind you that it's during our chairmanship in 2010 that we tried uh, hard to preserve and develop OEC relevance. And uh, it's uh, uh, the only OEC summit in the 21st century uh, was uh, hosted uh, by Kazakhstan in 2010. And in Astana Declaration, uh, we reiterated the founding principles of OEC and introduced the concept of indivisible uh, Euro-Atlantic and Euro-Asian security. So uh, speaking now of Afghanistan, we should uh, clearly be aware that uh, this is not only an issue for Central Asia, but uh, this, uh, this is an issue for the entire OEC area from Vancouver to Vladivostok. So uh, it's uh, uh, clearly uh, unfortunate for me to speak on Afghanistan uh, uh, in the absence of Afghani uh, representative, but uh, uh, I'll try to give a perspective uh, from Central Asia uh, on uh, uh, current situation, current developments in Afghanistan. Uh, Briefly speaking, we don't have uh, alarmists' uh, uh, view on the development of situation in Afghanistan. We believe that uh, we have a full confidence that uh, Afghani authorities are capable of uh, controlling uh, the situation and leading uh, the country. Uh, the uh, military phase uh, should uh, give way to uh, massive economic uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation uh, supported by uh, the entire international community so as to make Afghanistan a uh, self-sustaining uh, country. Uh, we, uh, that said, uh, uh, we have uh, recently uh, uh, noted one very worrying uh, trend, which is uh, the ISIS. Uh, well, uh, uh, we closely monitor the situation in, in the country and we've uh, noted that uh, some uh, Taliban uh, groups uh, uh, make connections to ISIS and the penetration of uh, that uh, radical uh, 
uh, violent uh, extremist ideology to Afghanistan is a could be a, a, a game changer uh, with regard to the uh, stability and security in Central Asia. Uh, it's uh, commonly known that uh, uh, Taliban mostly had uh, uh, internal national agenda, uh, but uh, with uh, ISIS uh, ideology uh, penetration, we may uh, have uh, very um, difficult times uh, for uh, all the neighboring countries. Uh, let me, uh, uh, this is uh, a trend that uh, should be uh, closely monitored and uh, uh, we Central Asian uh, nations uh, do have a PT experience, uh, bit experience of uh, uh, dating back to the uh, uh, 2000s, uh, the early years of uh, the 20th centuries when some uh, radical uh, groups penetrated uh, the territory uh, of uh, Central Asian nations and uh, uh, created an instability situation. Uh, uh, since that time, uh, uh, Central Asian uh, countries, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, but uh, particularly those countries uh, neighboring Afghanistan, did uh, a lot uh, uh, to improve their uh, uh, capabilities to withstand uh, that kind of uh, uh, pressure uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, that's uh, numerous uh, uh, assistance programs run uh, through the uh, OEC, through European Union, through uh, some bilateral efforts uh, uh, that uh, led uh, to the uh, uh, increased uh, uh, capacity of uh, Central Asian nations to withstand that pressure. However, uh, what, another point I would like to make uh, uh, at the outset is that uh, uh, the linkage, uh, the connection of Afghanistan and Central Asia is, uh, 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 is, will not automatically be leading to the uh, uh, successful rehabilitation of uh, Afghanistan because uh, Central Asian nations Central Asian countries have a uh, uh, huge number of uh, internal problems uh, uh, ranging from uh, uh, migration, water issues, uh, uh, economic, uh, 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 different economic ways. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it's quite unfortunate that uh, uh, Central Asia is still the world's uh, most uh, uh, the least integrated region uh, of uh, uh, the world. Thereby, uh, the uh, efforts, uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, in, be it in trade area or in uh, infrastructural projects that could uh, connect Afghanistan to Central Asia may not automatically uh, be a success story, uh, both for uh, Central Asians and for Afghanistan. This is uh, 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 a situation that uh, we should uh, equally pay attention to. Uh, it's not only Afghanistan that we should uh, focus on, but uh, uh, we should equally be focusing on the problems of uh, Central Asian nations as well. Great, and we'll talk much more about that and in the question and answer. Question. And I do apologize, I didn't say at the outset that we're missing uh, the finance minister of Afghanistan, he was unable to make it today, but we do get an on-the-ground perspective um, about Afghanistan from our next speaker, Nicholas Hasem. He's the uh, special representative of the UN Secretary General for Afghanistan and a South African lawyer who has had a long career working on governance, constitutional, and electoral reforms. He um, has worked on that in Iraq, for instance, in his own country, South Africa, as an advisor to um, Nelson Mandela and has worked um, also in the Burundi, Burundi peace talks and Sudan's. And he's just back from the UN Security Council where he got another year extension on the UN mandate in Afghanistan. So we'll hear from him what his expectations are for this coming year. Okay, perhaps I can just start by uh, emphasizing and underlining some of the issues which the Deputy Minister highlighted because one of our priorities is to support a regional engagement in Afghanistan. And I think if you look at Afghanistan's challenges for the forthcoming year, 
uh, a deteriorating economic situation uh, with an increasing fiscal gap in an economy which is already very aid dependent, uh, a massive security challenge in dealing with armed and violent conflict which ranges across the country, uh, and real political challenges in establishing structures of governance uh, under a complicated government of national unity arrangement. Now those are formidable challenges if you throw in the problems of dealing with the uh, 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 trafficking, both of narcotics and of people uh, and of materials, um, then you appreciate that all of those problems are too big for Afghanistan to deal with alone. It needs concerted regional engagement uh, and we, not, we need to take note that it is a divided region, a rough neighborhood, and so we've put uh, considerable effort in backing a regional engagement through the Istanbul process, but also through all other ways in which the region can engage, not just in support of security, but also in support uh, of trade and uh, economic uh, issues. We would just highlight that uh, one of Afghanistan's particular relative or comparative advantages is its geography. It links a uh, energy-starved south with an energy-rich north. It links the east and the west. And that geography enables it uh, to possibly play a hub role in the region. And for all of those uh, reasons, we, uh, we strongly support the engagement of the neighbors of Afghanistan in solving the problems which Afghanistan faces. And we stress that this is underwritten by a logic of self-interest, not a logic of charity. Um, I've noticed in my uh, recent engagement with many of the Central Asian republics and some of the other neighbors, really two gut responses or instinctual responses to the situation in Afghanistan. The first is they get the logic of the necessity of regional engagement in Afghanistan. But the second runs in the opposite direction, which is a real fear of contamination, uh, as it were, by a diseased patient, uh, and the uh, possible response of closing the gates to Afghanistan to prevent the movement of narcotics and uh, extremism uh, and even refugees from Afghanistan into their own country. And we've strongly encouraged them to opt for the first and not for the second. What Afghanistan needs is open borders. Uh, the second priority for the United Nations, certainly going forward, and we appreciate the support we've consistently received from the OSCE and all of these functions, is what is, in a particular UN term, providing good offices. Providing good offices, uh, either in regard to uh, domestic disputes over elections or in providing uh, some uh, basis for credible uh, electoral practices which would stabilize the country uh, in regard to promoting a peace process and I can return to that later because I think the peace process is an important part of uh, our future uh, calculations. And also simply encouraging a government to function uh, in, a, uh, in a coherent way. And of course domestic stability is an important part of the broader security puzzle. Uh, and in that regard, I think Afghanistan has made some progress. We've seen the first democratic transfer of power from one elected government to another. We've seen a government of national unity established. And in our views, that's an important development because a country facing the scale of the challenges, which I've just sketched out, uh, needs to do it with a degree of national unity, uh, a coherent vision, uh, and a country which is more or less uh, working together and not divided 50% against government policies and 50% for. That will be important for approaches to a peace process, it will be important for electoral reforms, it will be important for the anti-corruption measures, important for the reforms which are necessary for economic invigoration. The third area where the United Nations will be concentrating on is on human rights, and particularly women's rights. Uh, here I would just single out the United Nations produces very important reports on civilian casualties uh, arising from the conflict. We engage with all the parties to the conflict, 
on the really disturbing. Last year, 10, 000, over 10,000 civilian casualties, uh, and the figure is rising year on year, and we engage with all the parties, including the Taliban, raising with them what are international standards regarding uh, conduct of combat operations in order to minimize civilian casualties. We also produce a report on conditions of detention, and quite frankly, our latest report, which came out in, uh, less than a month ago, really highlights that uh, the practice of torture is pervasive and systemic. And although the government has, quite frankly, constructively uh, agreed to address these issues, uh, it's an issue uh, which needs uh, uh, to be tackled, if only because we want Afghanistan to reflect the progress that's made over the last 13 years, including on human rights, uh, and, not to, and, and not slip back. And finally, uh, we, the United Nations is and has been really centrally involved in what is called donor coordination and coherence. It sounds boring, mm -hmm. but it's an increasingly important part of the uh, picture and the contribution because the legacy of donor uh, aid programs in Afghanistan has not been positive. Great. Many, many challenges. So next we're going to hear um, a more of an academic viewpoint of what's happening in the region um, from Dr. Sharbanu Tajbaksh. She's a professor of human security at the prestigious Sciences Po in Paris and author of numerous books and articles about the region. She was a consultant for the UN on Central Asia and in the 90s worked for the UN Development Program. And she's come a long way to talk to us, and we'd like to hear her thoughts on the security issues facing the country and, and again, how to integrate it into the region. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the OSC and the Wilson Center. Uh, about 20, maybe more than 20 years ago, I was a, between my undergraduate and graduate, I was a, actually a research associate or an intern at the Kennedy Institute. So it's, be, it's nice to be back here. Um, <laughs> As was I. Or, yes, as exactly. Well. <laughs> the same year, apparently, too. Um, I wanted to give my opinion about the regional cooperation possibilities. Um, President Ashraf Ghani Ahmad Zai, when he came on board, he came on a, very much of an interest or a ticket on promoting regional integration. Um, in his talk at the Chatham House in December, and if you have an opportunity, go and see that because the webcast is available, he had some very interesting things to say about you know, the, the need for regional cooperation because we all have this, the region has the same security problems and faith state in one country would actually bring out the rest and common opportunities. And as, as Sir Hamson said, the, um, the kind of, you know, the gateway to the warm waters and what the economic opportunities that Afghanistan represents. He painted a, a region which can be integrated and the support will come for infrastructure that's needed from China, specifically. But I'd like to raise four problems with that kind of a vision of a, of a regional cooperation that could be also taken into consideration by OEC if it's interested in moving to that region. I'll make my three recommendations. The first problem with the kind of vision for a regional integration is that you have to have a center that holds. You have, you know, you know if the heart of Asia, for example, needs to have a heart that is credible, legitimate, sovereign, ca capable. And actually, on the capacity of the Afghan government, I have to say that um, I, I do actually have lots of belief in them because for the Istanbul process, the heart of Asia, they've set up a ministry in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the whole department. They're doing quite amount, amazing amounts of coordination on the uh, confidence building measures. But the problem about the trust of the regional countries on the viability of the government and whether it will hold and what the SRSG and um, uh, Hemsen talked about, the fact that you know, this dual structure, would it actually hold? What will exactly happen to the government of Afghanistan? and uh, how much you know, legitimacy and durability, how much um, sustainable peace will actually uh, take place in the heart. So that's the first problem for regional integration. The second one is the economic um, vision. I think that the Central Asian countries have become quite interested in this. If you've seen a number of uh, opportunities being discussed by the Turkmen about selling gas and then uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan giving electricity, um, transit, railroads by Uzbekistan, quite a lot of movement on the question of economic pot potential. But again, without one big investor in this question, you know, how much really would there be trust by private sector to invest in the region that still remains very unstable? 
and who actually can guarantee the security that's needed for economic cooperation. My third problem is with this question of this regional security, common security vision. Um, if we take it from a status perspective, you know, the, the, the idea is that these countries have the same common security problem. But I'd like to give you a devil's advocate or you know, uh, uh, perspective that perhaps from the perspective of the countries, it's not the non-state actors that are the threat in this region, but it is actually interests of the states that are being played out on the ground of Afghanistan. For example, India-Pakistan rivalry, Iran-Saudi Arabia, um, you know, it's the shared Sunni rivalry, and then the Central Asia kind of hold back and wait to see what happens between Russia and the US and China in, Central, in Afghanistan before taking a move. So perhaps this common security is not really so common after all. And maybe Afghanistan needs to become more neutralized so that Afghanistan, Afghan soil will not be used um, for, used for, for um, this kind of real politic. But when it comes down to the idea that whether ISIS or non-state actors do represent a common threat to the region, and I do also agree with the, our Deputy Foreign Minister from Kazakhstan, who mentioned that there is quite a lot of concerns about the phenomenon of ISIS, which has come to the region recently, as of January of this year, so December of this year. And it's as opposed to the Taliban, which were Pashtun and had a pan-Afghan interest and not necessarily interested in going over the Abu Dhabi. ISIS does have interest to go over, not only the Abu Dhabi, but take over the whole Khorasan area. And ISIS is also multi-ethnic as opposed to very Pashtun or you know, more limited um, Taliban. So ISIS also does huge amounts of recruitment in Central Asia. Um, the numbers are very contested, but huge amounts of Central Asians are actually fighting with ISIS forces in Iraq and in Syria now. So ISIS is a common problem. However, here again, I would say that it's the approach to this problem of radicalization is not the same between Central Asia and Afghanistan. Um, in Central Asia, it's a question of prevention. It's a question of loss, of kind of looking for a kind of a ideology in this vacuum. It's very much uh, security forces dealing with this issue, that intelligence, intel in terms of true intelligence. Um, and Versus in Afghanistan, the presence of ISIS is a continuation of the entire war economy, war tradition, and it's actually taking that tribal problem into a more of an Islamic one. And the response in Afghanistan is much more uh, force-driven with the ANSF and the foreign troops. So it's a very different approach to this question of radicalization. So it brings me to my recommendations. And number one, I think that um, this region um, I mean, I am for, and I have constantly been talking about the fact that we need uh, regional vision, regional um, integration, but I would take that with the caveat about the type of optimism that this is a region, that this vision, the heart of Asia, Istanbul process, you know, the, the Silk Road, the new Silk Road, etc., cannot be overly optimistic. However, that does not mean that people, to, you know, projects or expert level, you know, exchanges cannot happen. We have organized a number of meetings in Central Asia to which Afghans have come, and the exchanges of experiences between these two regions at the expert level is invaluable, and this is something that OEC can do very easily. And second recommendation is to have more of a sec people security approach, human security approach to this question, because what we really are neglecting is the actual, the, the common people. Even in the economic visions, it has to be about employment, in the drug fight, it has to be about the farmers, about the border control, it has to be about the border communities. And finally, the question of Islam in this region. We need to have a serious rethought or a kind of a discussion, a debate on, you know, what is Islam that comes from the region and what is Islam that is alien to the region and have that discussion openly created. And I think that's perhaps something that Odil could do. And huge amount, this is a region that where Sufism came from, today it has become a region from which extreme radicals are coming out. So why is that? And then this entire discussion about, it's not a Shiite Sunni thing, it is about kind of moderate Islam and uh, you know, Hanafi versus Salafi and all kinds of discussions that needs to be taking place. Thank you. Great, so, and she had some great ideas there. So next we're going to hear from Odir to see if those are some of the things you're working on already. This is uh, Michael Link. He's the director of the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. He's a former minister of state for Europe in the German government and was in the German parliament from 2005 to 2013. And he's here to talk about what the OSCE um, 
what his office is doing in the region, not just in Afghanistan. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also, welcome from my side to Wilson Center today. It's a timely discussion because, indeed, this year, especially this year, is a time where regional cooperation in Central Asia and Afghanistan matters. I would be glad to take up a lot of the points I heard uh, when the three speakers speaking ahead of me were talking. Um, because indeed, I think that OSCE, all powers of OSCE, both the field presences and the institutions together, and we will speak about that together, together with, with uh, Marcel Peshko, that we can do that. And why especially this year? Because I think the, the year, this year should be the key year. We have three phenomena now coinciding. coinciding. We have the step-by-step -step withdrawal for, of ISAF in Afghanistan. Then, of course, we have, as you mentioned, the increasing activity of ISIS or ISIL or Daesh or however you would like to call it. And then, of course, you have in all major, um, uh, no, in all left one, left leave aside one countries in Central Asia this year, elections. You had elections in Uzbekistan, presidential, parliamental. You had elections in Tajikistan. We will have parliamentary elections in Kyrgyzstan, and we will, last not least, have very important presidential elections in Kazakhstan in the end of April. This is an important event, and for OSCE elections have always been also at the center of attention. And these three elements combined should, I think, also give a new push then to increased regional cooperation. And we had, by the way, uh, not long ago, the elections in Afghanistan, where Odir was um, participating and um, at a key point even implicated in the monitoring of these elections. We do that, by the way, uh, not for the first time. We do it uh, as an activity since 2004, then again in 2005, 9, and 10. We always had electoral support teams in Afghanistan. And as a really very important partner for cooperation of OCE, we as an OCE institution stand ready to have our activities there, provided we have the possibility to do that, and also to have some activities going beyond elections. I will speak about that. I think what is very important when you see the assessment, what we had, for example, of the last electoral report of Afghanistan, and I really, really recommend you to read it because we try to, to mention very, very closely in, in, in detail where the shortcomings are, where the improvements need to be, to be as concrete as possible, I think it is very important that we do not forget that, especially in the area of women representation in political life, of strengthening of political party system, which is a long way to go, certainly in Afghanistan, and last not least, the very, very, very difficult of the issue of the voter register um, and the civil society observers in elections, that is the key areas where it needs to be worked. And in many of these areas, in, your central, in the Central Asian neighbors, there are already very, very good experiences where since the 1990s we have developed in some of the Central Asian partners very good experience on that. Take the voter register, for example. We want to do with all the partners in the region, uh, we want to do it, by the way, in Mongolia, and then another very important partner, not exactly, of course, of Central Asia, uh, but uh, a very important member of the OSCE participating state since a few years. We are intending to have very soon a, um, on the invitation of the Mongolian government and under participation of all Central Asian states and as Afghanistan, a seminar on electoral integrity in Ulaanbaatar very soon where we try to work concretely on all these issues to follow up in order to have uh, here a very concrete improvement in the system of electoral systems. Beside that, of course, we are very active in many other topical areas. Topical areas, let me just quote them as they are, of course, I think very important to mention them because very often Odia is only seen as an electoral observer. We are doing in Central Asia activities for the promotion of the rule of law. We are having now increasing uh, activities on safeguarding freedom of religion or belief. I think what you mentioned is very important, and we stand ready also to do more there. Then, of course, the very important topic, promoting political participation of women, one of the key activities of, uh, of ODIR. Uh, here, of course, this is a very, very important point, including youth in democratic process, political party development and regulation, and 
last not least, countering violent extremism and terrorism. This is, let me elaborate a little bit on that, this is maybe something which really needs to be now especially explicitly increased. We see when I speak with the governments of Central Asia um, and uh, with other actors also from civil society, we feel the need that more is being done there, but not exclusively from the very narrow security side, but applying the broad human, uh, the broad security um, understanding what OSCE brings. Because for OSCE, security is even always more than just intelligence or police or detention. It is the inclusive concept of security, including the human dimension of security. And therefore, we advocate in ODIR, we advocate very much a human rights-based approach when counteracting violent extremism and terrorism in order not to create uh, new adapts of some sort of opposition, it is very important that whenever we fight, and resolutely fight, and if necessary also with all means fight terrorism, we nevertheless need always to keep in mind that only a human rights-based approach uh, can really bring the peace building and reconciliation process we hope to, bring, uh, to be seen by that. So that is a very important point what we like, uh, of course, here to remind, and what is sometimes, I think, in the discussions, a little bit forgotten. It is, by the way, also, I think, the most sustainable way to attack uh, all forms of radicalization, because only inclusion of these forces in the society, you cannot just uh, jail everybody who, for the time being, has a different dissenting opinion or has some sort of sympathy for a criminal activity, it's important to bring them back to the society and therefore an inclusive approach is so important in order to overcome and to have a society which in the end is uh, able to finally overcome also this phenomenon of radicalization. That's from my side for the time. And uh, again, um, the regional cooperation, I think it's the right year. It's uh, for all the three reasons, and there is no time to lose. <coughs> Thank you. And rounding off this panel, we have our OSCE respondent down on the end there. That's um, Ambassador Marcel Peshko. And he's a uh, former official in the Slovak Foreign Ministry and has since May of 2012 has been the director of the Office of the Secretary General of the OSCE, so please. Thank you very much, and also thank you for having this opportunity to join this panel today. Well, we, when we are discussing with Wilson Center what should be the focus of the security days, we didn't hesitate even a minute that it should be also about Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, I think the key message here should be that this region should remain very high on our agenda and as ISAF withdraws and there is this new uh, focus on the transformation or consolidation of the situation, if you will, both in Afghanistan and wider region, we really, we really need to not to refocus to other areas. And now we have, of course, challenge with the situation uh, crisis in and around Ukraine and broader crisis of European security. But we really need to keep Afghanistan and Central Asia under our scrutiny. Uh, well, and therefore, we, we try to put it on the, on the debate today uh, because we see also the OSC's role here as a strong promoter, both in terms of uh, promoting dialogue, but also implementing policies, different policies, and creating an umbrella for the cooperation uh, on the bilateral basis, but also within respective international organizations, such as the European Union, NATO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. CSTO, and of course, UN, uh, which is in the, in the focus of that. Uh, so I hope that this debate will bring also a new impetus to, to what we do in Vienna. Let me just remind to those who don't know, Afghanistan is not participating state of the OSC. They are not our member state. They are our partner for cooperation, meaning that, uh, they, have, that they don't have any voting right, but they have a right to participate in our meetings and we have, the, of course, the opportunity to work with them, but we can't work in Kabul. We, we are working uh, with Afghanistan through our presence in all Central Asian participating states. As uh, Ambassador Zanier just mentioned this morning, we have quite strong presence there. Uh, we have five missions, about 500 people uh, all around the Central Asia, engaged in many different um, uh, facets of, of promoting capacity building and pro promoting bilateral regional cooperation. 
And I think now the, the key niche where the OSC is focused, a part of, of course, the human dimensional support of election process and democratic buildings, it's border management. We see borders both as a, as a uh, area where we could improve uh, uh, security of respective participating states, where we could address issues like illicit uh, trafficking in drugs, uh, uh, in human beings, uh, in uh, spillover of uh, terrorist activities, and of course, uh, issue of uh, foreign fighters. But we also see borders as an opportunity to uh, promote people-to-people -people contact, to promote investment and trade, to normalize situation uh, among respective uh, Central Asian countries and Afghanistan. And here we have different projects uh, there on the ground. But what I must tell you is that uh, we are seeing that the resources which have been uh, assigned for implementation of this project are draining out as they are moved towards uh, Ukraine and, and supporting our presence there. So it, it leaves us with a lot of great ideas, but simply we don't have enough, cap enough resources to implement it at the moment. And as it just was mentioned, uh, before me, there is a lot of uh, still challenges going on. Um, I have read your papers from maybe a year or two ago, and uh, uh, you put forward a few scenarios. Uh, some of them were quite pessimistic, you know, partition of Afghanistan or uh, well, prevalence of Taliban and maybe other ethnic groups, then role of uh, Tajikistan and, and uh, Turkmenistan in Afghanistan as well. Uh, I think that the scenario we put forward that we would, wouldn't either have an optimistic progress, neither very bleak scenario prevails, meaning that uh, we have government, we have institutions uh, in place, but as you, said, as you, said, as you just said, uh, quite fragile. The government is not yet consolidated. Uh, we have still lack of trust by, by others to this government. So I think what is needed is that we need to consolidate our resources to support these processes. The security is not uh, improving in Afghanistan. It's not improving in the region as well. Uh, we are all talking about the regional cooperation, but the key regional issues, such as water management, for instance, or uh, fighting organized crime, or fighting corruption, uh, uh, radicalization. In these areas, we don't see a lot of regional cooperation at the moment. Uh, we have bilateral ones, uh, some, some areas we have uh, leadership but by some uh, states in the region. However, we don't see a real regional effort to address, for instance, border issues or water management issues. So I think there is uh, room for, for us, including the OSC, in cooperation with the UN and others to continue addressing these issues. I have once met uh, the former deputy minister of Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Ludin, and uh, asked him, you know, why actually Ar Afghanistan wants to work with uh, the OSC? What, what's that, what's that attract uh, the attraction they have there? And he said, you know, I visualize the situation or the consolidation processes in Afghanistan and in the, reg in the region along the lines you have managed it down there in Europe. Because we feel this... Uh, contradictory uh, tendencies, this geopolitics, also in Afghanistan. And, and we, we, are, we have analyzed the role of the, of the CSC and the OSC, how you manage to build these bridges, how you manage to engage uh, those contradictory uh, processes and engage uh, respective governments into dialogue and, and develop rules, which are now violated. But anyway, we have been able to develop these rules. And we would like to be motiv motivated, incentivized by, by the similar situation. So I think there is not only role of the OSC on the ground, but there is also role of the OSC as an inspiration for, for that region. And I think uh, heart of uh, Europe, uh, heart, of, <laughs> sorry, heart of Asia process was slightly inspired by, by the OSC. However, is not that much focus on the human dimension, for instance. So uh, this is where I see uh, the role of uh, uh, EU, for instance, or, or the NATO, or the, uh, or the OSC, where we would be pushing this uh, uh, humanitarian or human dimension forward. Uh, on the other hand, as it was said, this, this process is welcome. However, it needs to be more anchored. To, to, it needs to be more institutionalized. Uh, we really don't see uh, 
too much of a role for the OSC when it comes to uh, ensuring implementations of re respective C uh, confidence building measures. We would like, we are ready to, to help them to implement those, but however, we are not part of that. We are partly working on, on counter-narcotics, for instance. Uh, uh, you might be aware of our Border Management Staff College in Dushanbe, which is quite effective in uh, training uh, border experts, border management exper experts, uh, including from Afghanistan. Uh, we have trained uh, so far 600 experts from Afghanistan who are now operational. And together with uh, Uzbeks, Tajiks, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and others coming from the OSC area. So this is quite a successful project. Uh, however, still not yet uh, included in our unified budget. So we run it since 2009 as an extra budgetary project and have to beg for money every, every year on. Uh, then we have OSC Academy in Bishkek, which provide, provides full uh, um, education in the area of politics, diplomacy, uh, regional cooperation, etc., where we have also trained and educated uh, uh, students for Afghanistan and Central Asia. These institutions can do much more. They, they can be used for really uh, creating this regional cohesion and helping respective participating states and Afghanistan to develop their own capacities. If there is more political push for that, if there is more resources and understanding that OSC should be, should be used. What we see now, unfortunately, is some sort, sort of uh, uh, pressure on, on our presences in the area. Uh, we, we, we feel that uh, OSC's role is not that much uh, supported by, by some governments as it was in the past. At the same time, we see that there are ongoing challenges, so some of them even growing as, as we see this uh, erosion of structures. So let me just uh, uh, mention good governance or, or corruption or even the radicalization. So we would really uh, appeal of, of, on the host governments to, to continue working with the OSC and, and use, it, use it for, for their benefits. Uh, so if you ask me about the future, it's, it's difficult to say at this stage. Uh, however, uh, my message would be that keep uh, the, the region on, on your map and keep our institutions like the OSC on your map as well. Support us. We have effective tools. We have expertise. Uh, and there is also a need to work with respective governments to engage them into the regional cooperation. Great, thank you. So we're going to uh, take questions in a little bit, but first I want to pose a few questions here. Uh, first to Mr. Hasem, yesterday at the um, Security Council, you seemed optimistic that, about peace talks um, in Afghanistan. Uh, we've heard this before, you know, the U.S. has tried to push behind the scenes. What signs are you seeing, um, and what have your contacts been like with uh, the Taliban? Well, let me start off by saying that I think there's a question mark over the whole Afghan project unless uh, they can come to, Afghans can come to an arrangement under which they can live together in peace and harmony. And that is simply because the current initiatives, the current dependency on aid is simply unsustainable in the long term. Uh, there will be increasing competition for what we might call donor dollars whether it's for Ukraine or Syria. Uh, and so there has to be an end eventually to the conflict. And, and how much of the budget is aid dependent right now? Oh, I would say up to 80%. 80%. So there's an, there's an enormous, and it also distorts the economy as well, as does the military efforts. Uh, a huge amount of resources, including the resources which Afghans have, goes into sustaining uh, the, the military uh, dimension. So from that perspective, peace is, it's not an immediate necessity, but it's certainly a necessity in the long term. And peace processes take some time, and we would want to encourage uh, peace processes, a uh, peace process as soon as possible. The only viable peace process is one in which the Afghan government engages <coughs> the armed opposition groups. And that's certainly what we would want to encourage, not uh, 
certainly there is space at an initial stage for track two developments, for engagements between citizens. Uh, 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 certainly there's room for engagement with the neighbors because I think the neighbors have an important role to play in sustaining a peace initiative, but they also require uh, some, not guarantees, but they need to see what a peaceful Afghanistan would look like and what it would mean for them. And I'm thinking, obviously, about India and Pakistan and Iran uh, and others. So there is a need for an engagement, maybe even by the OSCE, to engage the neighbors. But the fundamental core of a process is one in which Afghans engage Afghans. And I always say to Afghans that in Africa we say the doctor can't take medicine on behalf of the patient. Afghans have to, uh, in a sense, engage in this awkward and demanding process. Now, my own view is that there's a positive alignment at the moment of a number of factors. A new government in uh, Kabul, which has prioritized the peace process, really important developments in Pakistan, where, and maybe as a result of uh, President Ghani's engagement with Pakistani authorities, they have indicated a willingness to step up to the table, as it were, and... Um, lend some weight towards pushing the parties uh, to the negotiating table. We've also had an important indication from China, and it's quite clear, and I've asked Taliban leaders this issue, is it important that, uh, if, that China has uh, indicated its strong support for a reconciliation process? And they've conceded that it is, because uh, China is going to be an important player in the region for a long time to come. So uh, it has to be factored in. Against all of those is the possibility that, cert that among some of the insurgent groups there's another logic. And that logic would say uh, the, the international forces are withdrawing. We need to test the capacity of the Afghan national security forces and to see whether they can hold their ground unassisted or on their own. Uh, and this is the year to do it. Um, and it may well be that we will see an intensification of conflict uh, during or at the opening of this year's fighting season, which starts shortly, uh, usually with the so-called spring offensive. Um, we're worried, of course, that that will set back the prospects of a peace process. But at the moment, we've had contradictory indications uh, indicating an interest in a peace process, maybe as a response to pressure from the Pakistanis, as the Pakistanis themselves have claimed. But what is also clear is that peace processes are fragile things. They're like seedlings. They've got to dig roots. You've got to have meetings whose sole objective is to have another meeting rather than to deliver, as it were, final products and ceasefires in the short term. Um, and so we would want to uh, and are lending our support to nurturing contacts, which will take place, I think, at this stage, uh, probably under the radar, and necessarily so because I don't, I'm not sure that the Taliban can take uh, um, uh, an immediate um, shift in its strategic posture without uh, risking serious divisions and splinters within the organization. So it's a process they also need time to work through. Uh, I don't think there's any time to lose it. I think that the way to, to work towards an eventual ceasefire is to start talking as soon as possible, not to expect a ceasefire up front, but to see it as a, a product of the talks. But overall, as I'm suggesting, I'm hopeful that it's not only possible, uh, but is achievable in, in, within this year. And if you've talked about uh, ISIS as being a game changer here. Do you worry that that gets in the way of this peace process as well? Well, uh the, this is, uh, uh, at the moment, this is, uh, uh, I would say, a theoretical threat. But uh, eventually, uh, uh, we should closely monitor the, the, these developments. And uh, the uh, ISIS ideology is uh, uh, not a positive one in any respect. So uh, with regard to peace process, that will be a huge spoiler. I, I don't believe that uh, the... Uh, any ISIS uh, penetration, any ISIS uh, establishment in Afghanistan will be a positive for a peace process. No way for that. 
And, and tell me how far you think ISIS has really penetrated, because uh, Mr. Hasem yesterday at the Security Council said they have a foothold, but it's more of a, a flagpole, I think you described it as, a way that splinter groups could gravitate toward that. Do you think it's more than that? I've been quite surprised by the sudden appearance and widespread of ISIS that really happened as of the second half of uh, December, with the settlement of some families, apparently, who were non, you know, they were non-Afghan, I mean, Central Asians, Arabs, etc., in the south, and then now we hear about them in the northern areas, on the borders of Central Asia, you know, lots of rumors about, you know, the, the skirmishes or the, when they come over to Turkmenistan, they may be ISIS. It's, it's very unclear, but the fact that there's all these kinds of fear that, I mean, for me, the, the, the appearance and also the fact the ongoing hostage crisis of these 30 Hazaras that are Shiite taken and, and the Taliban having said that they're they not behind this. And so the echoes of what is happening also among, you know, how ISIS executes Christians, etc., on the other side of the you know, in the Middle East. So it's a, for me, the, the, the more Taliban leadership moves into a peace process with the government, the more there's a possibility that you will actually continue to have, you know, spoilers that are not necessarily very native to the region. It's a very new, different type of a phenomenon, I see. It is not at all a continuation of the Taliban, you know, movements or, or grievances. It's a completely new thing. But it's, I, I find that a force to be reckoned. It has to be taken into consideration, yeah. So, Mr. Link, when you look at this emerging threat, how, how, what does the OSCE do to respond? Well, as, as I said, of course, we uh, get increasing, uh, and, and usually what we do is, of course, in, uh, always in close cooperation with the participating states. Uh, we get increasing requests, by the way, not only from the Central Asian participating states, also from others, including Europe and, and, and the US, of course, that what can we do there? Of course, we, we uh, are elaborating programs um, in teaching materials, in anti-hate crime activities. Um, activities for the protection of freedom of religion and belief also is important there. So we have our programs and we stand ready to do that. But um, this was, I think, um, a phenomenon, of course, which is only highlighted now by ISIS. Um, independent of that, you had also a really dangerous phenomenon. Take the increase of anti-Semitism, for example, in parts of Europe. So we have clearly <coughs> here um, all over the place an increase of extremism, which is worrisome and troublesome. Activities will be needed. But again, I say, when fighting these, let us take a human rights-based approach and not just a very narrow-minded approach just of policing and of prosecuting. And in terms of supporting the peace process, I mean, this is a, a country where, as you said, 10,000 civilians were killed last year. I mean, the violence is just unbelievable, hard to fathom. Um, how do, is the OSCE doing something on the ground to foster this contact, this reconciliation process in Afghanistan? Well, we as ODIA not, of course. Uh, we have been limited. Our, our activity has been on the invitation, of course, the, limited to the monitoring of the elections. But of course, concerning the other areas of OSCE, I would, I would uh, I'd like to pass that question to, to Marcel, mm -hmm. uh, because we, in our team, have been limited to that, of course. And let me say, usually, of course, we never do that, uh, these activities as ODIA outside of the OSCE area. That was a large exception to the rule that we did something outside. But uh, of course, the, the uh, OSCE proper, of course, is very much engaged with the cooperation partners. Yes, if I may say, uh, first of all, I think what is important that uh, these uh, growing divisions and these uh, contradictory security narratives, which we are now seeing happening in the OSCE, uh, I think that we should try to uh, minimal, minimalize or to prevent their transfer into how we deal with the Afghanistan issue and, and Central, Central Asian issues. Uh, I think when uh, geopolitics uh, prevails, including in that area, we know from the history that uh, we have very limited then uh, uh, tools uh, to use organizations such as OSCE or, or the UN to really address these divisive issues. And I think this is where I see in a broader context role of the OSCE to really identify uh, 
uh, issues in uh, Afghanistan and, and broader, issue, broader area where, despite all these uh, uh, contradictory views and, and different security perspectives, key actors could play together and could implement common policies. And in that area, I think OSCE has been quite successful. We have uh, created the Department of Transnational Threats where we have uh, quite strong expertise in addressing all types of issues when it, when it comes to countering uh, terrorism, when it comes to assisting respective participating states to strengthening their capacities uh, in the area like policing, uh, the border management I mentioned already, radicalization. Uh, on the other hand, foreign fighters, it's a relatively new, new element on, on the international scene. I mean, uh, we just recently had uh, this White House summit here in, in Washington. Uh, and of course, uh, our Secretary General participated to it and uh, tried to present our vision and our, our role. We are, we are one of the many players, but I think our, our role is to, to keep this issue uh, from the angle of comprehensive approach to security, not to forget other, on other aspects than the radicalization, including the economic, social, um, exclusion, uh, of course, security and military aspects. So this is where, where I see the uh, role of the OSCE. And in practical terms, as I said, on the ground through our missions, we work with the respective governments to, to address these issues uh, through capacity building. Uh, next, uh, in May, uh, this May, we are planning to have uh, security days uh, sp specifically on these issues, how, uh, uh, how to prevent uh, activities which would lead to uh, radicalization through uh, not only tolerance, but also creating bridges within societies, social cohesion, but also among participating states and, and looking, look at it in a broader perspective. So I expect that uh, this issue will be also put higher on, on our agenda. And, uh, and as always, I mean, we would be ready to do that. I mean, OSC has a very broad, broad agenda. I mean, we are a very lean organization, but we need to see also real interest on the side of the governments to use this institution to address these issues. When it comes to peace process in Afghanistan, I think UN has, has the lead there uh, and should have the, the lead also in the future. Uh, uh, we are supporting this process through uh, working with Afghan gov government on all these other issues, also through capacity building, but uh, we cannot be present there. I mean, we, we simply as this is not our uh, member of participating state, we don't have an office there, and therefore we are trying to support them through our presences in Central Asia. Okay, before I turn to the audience, just one other quick question, and that is President Ghani is coming here to Washington next week. What does he need to get out of this trip, Mr. Hassan? <laughs> I think he, um, <clears throat> well, I think he'd been stretching back to the London conference. Uh, what is critical for him is continued financial support. Uh, he has developed uh, with his government a thoughtful and uh, I think appreciated uh, agenda for change in his paper, uh, Realizing Self-Reliance. Uh, now, now he needs the means to implement that uh, program. I think he will also be aware that the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, have indicated a capacity to hold their ground. And so it's not a question uh, really of uh, having the necessary security in instruments in place. It's a question of having the funding and support for them uh, through as long a period uh, as he can negotiate. Did you have something to add, Dr. Tashkosh? Yeah, I'd completely agree with this. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, we want to have plenty of time for the audience. So there's two microphones, one on each side right here. If you would just come to the microphone and um, identify yourself and ask your question. I think we'll just do one at a time for now. It's easier to handle at the beginning, at least. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm Helga Zepp. This is the Schiller Institute. Um, since the funding of this whole uh, <clears throat> development program for Afghanistan is so crucial, 
Don't you think that with the new Silk Road, right -wing uh, which has uh, <clears throat> you know, created a completely new dynamic in the world, where 50 countries are already participating, and just yesterday, um, Germany, France, and Italy uh, joined Great Britain to become founding members of the AIIB. Um, I think that there are many proposals which would really stabilize the situation, like Viktor Ivanov's proposal to electrify, uh, to, electri to have ele electrification in all of Afghanistan. And I think the obvious question is, can enough of the neighbors, including Russia, China, India, for whom Afghanistan is also a big security problem, and Iran, work together with the European countries and the United States in a joint effort to create a new paradigm which is now possible with the new Silk Road. I think the problem of the whole region, it, it's not just Afghanistan. If you look at Iraq, if you look at Syria, if you look at the entire region, it's a terrible mess and would it not require joining hands and go to a completely new paradigm, leaving the area of geopolitics and create a new paradigm for mankind in trying to solve this problem by a real economic development program because you have to give the young people hope. They have to have a perspective so that they don't join radicalization and that they don't uh, join ISIS, but that they want to study, that they want to create a family, that they have an income. All of these things would be possible if the countries of the world work together. I'd like to respond to that. Well. <laughs> Um, I, I think that, uh, of course, yes, I, obviously, there should be a new paradigm, there should be cooperation, everybody would gain from it. But the, the issue is that we should not be ignoring the realities that actually work against any type of new paradigm. There's been a number of decades of new paradigms and new ideas about neutrality, you know, belts and et cetera, or different. So why is it that they don't work? Because states have their own interests and they do not match because Afghanistan is surrounded by regional security complexes where states compete and sometimes have different types of interests. But I think that what you have raised something very important is that the people, I mean a paradigm this time that should not be state-centered because of the fact that the states do compete, but that the people in this region have been forgotten. And I think that if you actually come up with a new paradigm, it should be based on the potential of the people. And actually, I'm writing a paper now, perhaps for Chatham House, arguing that the way that Afghanistan can come out of its dependency would be actually to invest more of its own people. The same, you know, because there's huge amounts of potential in this region. That is, for example, in economic projects, it's all about infrastructure, very little about jobs. You know, we're hoping that this will create jobs, but we should go directly to create jobs. And we should actually directly create investments to do education for this region. This is the only way to also deal with radicalization. So if it's a new paradigm that is not state-centered, but really people-centered, I think it may have a chance. But unfortunately, we do live in the, you know, the, the world of states, and regional organizations are very state-centered as well. So that's the reality. Okay, excellent. My name is Craig Karp. I was an o sorry, uh, my name is Craig Karp. I was an OSCE monitor in Chechnya, a mediator. Uh, I was also at the Bonn Conference, the UN Bonn Conference, uh, as a diplomat. And uh, last year I was a visitor in Afghanistan during the last elections. I think in the absence of a representative from Afghanistan, it's important to note the really incredible progress that's been made in that country in the last uh, 13 or so years of international uh, involvement. And it's also important to recognize the, the national unity government for which uh, Mr. Hasten helped broker. Uh, is a government which has the, the support of probably about 80% of the population, perhaps more widely based than the governments in almost any OSCE member state, and that it, it is a government with a lot of potential. I have a couple of quick questions, which is, for Mr. Ashikbayev, there is a, a project in Central Asia to transfer electricity from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan through Afghanistan to Pakistan and perhaps beyond. Is Kazakhstan prepared to join such a project as a, both as a supplier, since it's an exporter of energy, and as an investor? Uh, for Mr. Hasem, uh, what is the prospects for transitional justice in, in Afghanistan? 
there's been recent uh, there's been a recent hubbub about the naming and shaming of some political leaders who uh, have had some questionable backgrounds. Obviously, in a country where it's been war for 25 years, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of blood to go around, and uh, uh, a clean slate may help uh, allow political situation to move forward. Uh, and finally, for the OSCE representatives, I'm a great supporter of the OSCE, having worked for it and been a consultant for it. Um, is the OSCE in a position politically to, since it's involved in Afghanistan, to encourage the member states, the participating states, particularly the Western states like the United States and the recently troop contributing states, to continue their support for Afghanistan in order to forestall the threats that you all have been talking about today? Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you go first. Thank you. Uh, you've mentioned oh, the uh, CASA 1000 project, oh. as far as I understand. There's no uh, answer. Central Asia, South Asia. Uh, well, uh, Kazakhstan wholeheartedly supports this uh, uh, project. We've uh, been uh, in the process. Uh, uh, I see the uh, Kyrgyz uh, ambassador is also here present. Uh, well, we've been in the process, and uh, we do support uh, that project. Uh, on different uh, uh, international, uh, within different uh, international financial organizations. Uh, with regard to your question whether we are uh, ready to be a supplier or investor, this is, uh, of course, uh, cost-benefit calculations will uh, definitely prevail. Uh, uh, as far as I understand, uh, the most emphasis is uh, put on uh, uh, making uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan uh, sustainable uh, 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 producers of uh, uh, energy within uh, uh, vegetation period and then uh, be uh, uh, use the same electricity lines to get uh, the uh, energy they need during winter uh, periods. So uh, we definitely will uh, see <coughs> those investments. Uh, Kazakhstan, that's a principal position of my government, to seek uh, uh, those investments that will create uh, uh, cross-regional uh, connections within Central Asia. As I mentioned, it's, uh, 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 the biggest problem of Central Asia is lack of economic integration. And uh, we do support any project that uh, fosters that type of integration. Uh, and in this regard, uh, well, we are supportive of it. Mr. Hasem. Uh, I think transitional justice remains very much a part of the public debate. Uh, a clear decision has not been reached, uh, obviously because there's a balance between those who want to argue for a fresh beginning and for a, uh, a new practice of accountability uh, 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 to strike a blow against impunity on the one hand, and those who believe that the uh, political structures and alliances are too brittle at the moment to withstand uh, a full transitional justice uh, process. Um, we are aware that the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission has conducted a full mapping of uh, the events and human rights abuses stretching back 13 years. Um, uh, that has not been released yet, and I think that that will be the issue that focuses uh, on which people will decide how to take forward the transitional justice uh, issue. Okay. And the OSCE question, who wants to tackle that? Well, I would answer that uh, we, as institutions, we do all possible to really keep uh, Afghanistan, Central Asia high on, on our agenda. And uh, I think, let me just use one, one small example. It was only recently when our mission in Ashgabat brokered U.S. offer to Turkmen uh, government to support their capacities when it comes to implementation of respective confidence building measure, which is part of the heart of uh, Asia process. So we were in a way a uh, bridge between the national support and, and, uh, and, and, and Turkmen government approval to the support. So I think that uh, OSC is seen as an honest broker when it comes to uh, supporting respective governments uh, capacity building. And uh, as I said before, uh, heart of Asia process is, uh, when you read it, it's really extremely interesting and if implemented, really could provide for building, uh, rebuilding the trust in the region 
and re-engaging with, with uh, Afghanistan. On the other hand, uh, the key issue there is capacities, availability of capacities on the side of those who are responsible to implement them. We have, of course, some participating states like Turkey who play extremely important role in ensuring that uh, this, this process is going ahead. Uh, and on the other hand is the ownership. Ownership by Afghanistan, but also by Central Asians and in the wider context by, by key players. Uh, what we are witnessing here is that uh, uh, there are different perspectives when it comes, for instance, uh, uh, to the role of SICA or to the role of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So uh, what we can do, and I, I hinted to that before, is to, to use the OSC as a platform for getting closer together with these organizations and, and looking for common narratives. And we have been trying to uh, outreach to SICA and uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization many times, and there are good, some good examples, but we can do more. You know, we can, for instance, uh, uh, promote the implementation of regional cooperation when it comes to countering terrorism uh, or when it comes to sharing best practices on border management uh, or when it comes to uh, working together on, on water issues. Uh, here we would need more coherence also among these key, key players and it comes from the participating states of course and, and, and key players there. We don't have outreach towards Pakistan or India and Iran. That's, that's not our area, but uh, we, can, we can really do much more in the, in the Central, Central Asia. Uh, uh, and, and for the future, I think is that uh, we should be more, more intensive in, in exploring where our common, common narratives are. And one of them, of course, it's uh, the, the, the furthering the consolidation of economic situation in Afghanistan and, and here that we have these big social economic projects, which uh, some of them are starting to be implemented, some of them are still waiting for implementation. And here we could be helpful. Uh, we have this, uh, these threats which are stemming from Afghanistan and, and are uh, imposing new, uh, new security situations in Central Asia and wider OSC region. But we can also say that there are some threats uh, which are exported from Europe or from Central Asia to Afghanistan, including ISIL. So this is one of the, one of the elements we should closely look at where, where the OSC could be also helpful. What, what I would like to say to you is that, yes, we, we do much, but we could do much more if, if there is a political will on the side of participating states. Okay, next question. Yelsey Bogoslovsky, uh, Wilson Center Project for Euro-Atlantic Security. My question is to uh, Mr. Hessem. Uh, Afghanistan for 15 years was basically one of the most important grounds for implementing different strategies in peacekeeping, peace building, stabilization, and post-conflict reconstruction. So my question is, what do you define as the most important lesson uh, that was learned and that the security promoting organizations such as UN or OEC could implement in their further practice? Well, I'll invite some of my panelists to also help me answer that question. Uh, bear in mind that the United Nations never had a peacekeeping force uh, there. Um, so um, I'm not really in a position to address the welter of questions around counterterrorism, uh, uh, counterinsurgency operations, uh, nor am I really in a position to talk about the effectiveness uh, of the aid uh, that was uh, delivered to uh, Afghanistan. But I think, though, that as we look back, there will be, and we see it almost daily, uh, increasing regret that aid was not used more effectively, that the level and the quantity of aid has left, uh, uh, I won't say no result, but not the result it could have left uh, if properly managed. Um, I think from uh, my perspective, which is very focused on conflict resolution. I think there were missed opportunities early on to broaden uh, 
involvement and inclusion in the Afghan state, uh, also including some of the groups which are now are in, in armed opposition, including the Taliban, uh, possibly at Bonn, uh, as early as Bonn, uh, which would have uh, left a very different situation. There are two. Why don't we take the, the two questions there so we can... Seems to be the end of the line. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Olga Algairova. I'm ambassador of Slovakia to the OEC in Vienna. Uh, thank you for, to the Wilson Center for hosting security days of the OEC here in Washington. From the first panel discussion on Ukraine, we have seen that we have uh, internal challenges to our European or Euro-Atlantic security. It means stemming from the region itself. And now we see that we have also external coming from unstable regions from outside of our region. And I would like to draw your attention on a concept of uh, security sector reform or governance. Uh, it's a relatively new concept. Uh, that is responding to those challenges of the global security environment. Uh, we have established a group of friends uh, of security sector reform and governance. Uh, one of them is in New York uh, within the UN. Another one is in uh, Vienna uh, within the OEC. And by the way, Afghanistan is a member of this group of friends of, on SSR. Uh, we are as well uh, elaborating technical guidelines for the field missions of the OEC. And I would have a question to distinguished panelists. Maybe Marcel Peshko would be the best to answer. Uh, can we consider a, a more effective, more accountable, more, more transparent governance of uh, police and, for instance, police or other security forces as a good conflict prevention measure in this region, but also generally in other regions. Thank you very much. And let's take the second, the second question there, too. Um, hi, I'm Kathy Kosman from the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, I had a fairly straightforward question, which is, uh, it seems to me that the religion laws in many, if not all, of the Central Asian countries um, violate their UN and OSCE commitments to respect freedom of religion or belief. So I would hope that, uh, uh, oh dear Director Lincoln, anyone else who would care to respond, could ask, answer how this uh, issue is part of the seminar experts meetings, regional meetings to address also the qu related question of I increasing extremism, because it seems to me that if one has laws that repress what should be legitimate religious activity, including that of the majority religion, Islam, that is a factor in increasing radicalization, or at least potentially so. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we, why don't we work our way back and if, answer those questions and if you have any final thoughts for us. So we'll start with you, Ambassador Peshka. I think also Mr. Harrison can talk about security sector reform in Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, but I'm aware of that, uh, of course, NATO is also in, involved in, in some, some helping to modernize the Afghan forces. And I would put it uh, from a different angle. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, annual budget of, of uh, Afghan national forces, uh, uh, the Afghan national army is about $4 billion or so about that. Uh, the budget of the OSC is uh, 142 million euro. And I think um, in Central Asia, our budget um, taken together, also extra budgetary contributions, is about 30 million euro. Uh, so I would support all activities which would lead to uh, modernizing and of, of the Afghan military forces and uh, uh, assuring that they would sustain also, for the future, they would be more effective uh, without uh, or with uh, decreased international support. And surely, uh, security sector reform, which is a much wider concept, which also includes justice system or uh, uh, intelligence and uh, also human rights in, or respecting of human rights in the, in the uh, uh, security sector area, uh, 
it should be the priority of the, of the gov gov government of Afghanistan. Of course, it's the question is to, when it comes to implementation of this and what are the tools when, when you have for, for insurgency and when you have uh, ongoing in fighting in some, some areas. Um, when it comes to the OSC, of course, we would be ready to provide expertise. Uh, uh, some, some time ago, we have been even discussing uh, to what extent uh, the, the code of conduct uh, for uh, military activities, which is uh, in place in the OSC since 1994 and provides for democratic governance of, uh, and more transparency of our military forces could be also applied in the Afghanistan situation. Uh, and I think it could, if there is uh, enough uh, interest on the Afghan side. Uh, we could be also talking about the regional confidence building measures uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, military exchanges or addressing uh, small and light weapons or uh, stockpiles of ammunition. So there are areas where OSC, as I said before, could be more helpful uh, in addressing the security or core security issues. Uh, however, I must admit that uh, these areas are quite underdeveloped today and uh, uh, we don't have uh, that much drive or, or, or interest on the side of respective governments, including Afghan government. And the religion question wants to tackle that one. Yes, this will be in the future one of the areas where we would like to increase our activities. Already now, we do already um, in the Central Asian countries, of course, not in Afghanistan, as I said, there the uh, activities are limited to election. Uh, we are already right now doing capacity building activities on international standards, on freedom of religion and belief. We do it both for civil society and state actors. <laughs> and we are already doing uh, promoting dialogue between different religious uh, belief communities. We didn't do yet the, that regional forum for that. What I mentioned with that regional forum is on elections, the one on in electoral integrity. But uh, uh, as I said, we are thinking about how we can increase here the possibilities and we are in contact with the states on that. I clearly see a need for that because as has been mentioned, of course, also by my colleague here on the podium, also the question, what sort of Islam, for example, are people going to worship. Um, in the different, it's very important to understand the different and complex backgrounds sometimes of the rural situation, the official Islam, the other ones, uh, those coming from, of course, uh, trying to, to, to be active um, with real extremist forms of Islam, of course. We need to very, very clearly understand that situation and then to try uh, to bring um, inclusive uh, uh, possibilities there that uh, people can practice their religion, of course, in a way which is not on the one side completely controlled uh, by uh, states, uh, but also not, of course, especially not influenced by the way how uh, terrorist or extremist uh, forces are trying to interfere. Uh, I'd like to second that because the introduction of these new laws and practices limiting uh, you know, religion and movement and association, etc., have been new as a result of the kind of wild, wild west type of thing that happened in Central Asia where the doors were open and so many people came in and so many unofficial uh, priests and unofficial mullahs and unofficial, unofficial madrasas opened up. So it is not to... Uh, to defend, this is not at all also my work, but we are, for example, on the question of counterterrorism, we are working with um, the governments and the media and religious leaders, etc., and how to actually come with a realistic way to allow the, you know, the freedoms, but in a way that actually gives opportunities for uh, awareness about what is considered the right way and then the, the kind of you know, external way or non-right way. So because it's, it's a very, I'm not sure that what we, it's too easy to say that these kinds of religion, these laws would create backlash and reaction. We always hear about that. But I think that the situation is much more complicated with that than that. And on the question of SSR, of course, beyond the technicality of the SSR, which I will leave my colleagues to talk about, again, I'd like to again emphasize on my, you know, seems like a bit of a demagogic thing to say, to emphasize on the trusting of the people. Because again, going back to the question of ISIS, I do agree with, I think, what um, Sir Shehemsen has been saying, that ISIS does not have 
um, popular, um, popular um, um, reaction, popular backing or support, right? And it also doesn't have support of Pakistan as well. So if you actually trust in the people, they will reject it. And it is a foreign thing that will be rejected. So the best way of SSR is also to trust in the people in order for them to also reject the elements that are not part of their society. Let me also uh, respond to the issue of religion laws. Uh, given this uh, very uh, serious security threats, uh, it's always uh, a dilemma for the governments, uh, uh, the security versus uh, freedom dilemma. And uh, it's, uh, well, uh, no one is perfect, and sometimes governments uh, uh, are uh, forced to uh, 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 take uh, unpopular decisions. But uh, in the essence, if you look at, uh, I'm not uh, speaking for the entire Central Asia, but uh, for Kazakhstan, if you, if you look at the uh, situation in that country, then you will see the genuine uh, uh, atmosphere of uh, interreligious uh, uh, peaceful coexistence of different uh, religions in Kazakhstan. And this is uh, the uh, core issue for us as we believe that the uh, preserving that inter-ethnic and inter-religious accord in the country of uh, uh, the population of which uh, consists of uh, uh, 100 plus ethnic groups and uh, uh, different religious denominations, this is the core of our uh, future development. And uh, as we run all the time, out of the time, but uh, mm -hmm. let me also point out to the uh, initiative of Kazakhstan uh, uh, which will uh, hold uh, uh, for the fifth time this uh, year uh, the Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions in Kazakhstan. Uh, please uh, look at the dates around uh, uh, 10th and 11th of June, and we will uh, very much uh, look forward to seeing uh, Secretary General Zanier and uh, the uh, Odir head uh, uh, Presence, uh, present at uh, that Congress. And this is uh, also a very important uh, forum. Uh, uh, and uh, we will try to uh, forge, uh, to urge uh, religious leaders uh, to come up with the unified uh, message uh, that uh, religion is about, all about the peace. Uh, the religion is not about the violence and uh, 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 the joint uh, manifesto of religious leaders uh, to their followers is, uh, uh, we believe, uh, should be a powerful tool to prevent the further radicalization of uh, uh, so many people around the world. Yeah, Mr. Hasem wanted one last word. Okay, let me resist my inclination never <laughs> to talk outside my field of expertise and address the security sector reform issues. <coughs> I think there have been two uh, running debates and will continue to be in Afghanistan about security sector reform. The first really is about effectiveness uh, of the security sector and it's one in which also those who uh, support and fund the military will also be engaged in. And that goes to the heart of the question or the heart of the question is what is the nature of the threat? And there is a an argument that that threat is asymmetrical uh, insurgency, guerrilla warfare, um, or whether, it's a con whether the ANA should be structured to fight a conventional warfare, and that relates to what kind of toys, I suppose, uh, you acquire to conduct your business. The second debate is around sustainability, which I've touched on already. Uh, 170,000 men in, under arms, that's just in the army, not in the security sector. Um, and also in combination with the question mark of, as to how sustainable the attrition rate is for the Afghan National Security Forces uh, compels those who do the planning and the structuring of the security institutions to take into account uh, as to how they would uh, sustain uh, this level uh, of their security uh, going forward. The particular live debate which we've been peripherally engaged in concerns the Afghan National Police. And that really is a, a simple debate between, or well, it's not really a debate, it's the conflict between the position that the Afghan National Police find themselves in. On the one hand, they're expected to be the interface 
between the community and the criminal justice system. They're supposed to be the trusted guardians of communities to which people can uh, report their domestic and, and other disputes, neighborhood disputes, and have the police play a constructive role uh, in both processing those disputes through conflict resolution mechanisms or taking them to court. But at the same time, the police is very much uh, in the front line in the fight against the, uh, uh, the fight against armed insurgents. And when I say very much in the front line, they are very much in the front line. The Afghan National Army really does take a back seat uh, in many of the cases. The police man all the checkpoints, they take the lion's share of casualties um, and the attrition rate question is far more pertinent when applied to the police. The debate which is taking place in Afghanistan is how to get the police out of this combat role in which the other is always defined as the enemy to the country as opposed to their primary role in which the other is a citizen, a member of the community and requires a completely different approach and engagement. Uh, the truth is, in Afghanistan, they don't have the luxury of simply separating those functions. In areas like Bamiyan, there are no army uh, 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 units present at all. The police is required to perform all the counterinsurgency operations, and so they have to do that and incorporate that function with the civilian function. The international community has been very concerned um, to see the police uh, move towards civilian policing, to see moving towards civilian oversight and civilian control and removing it from its paramilitary treatment and structures. Okay. Well, I've broken the first rule of broadcasting, which is I went way past the clock. <laughs> so, and I don't want to keep you from lunch anymore, so please, uh, hand, please uh, give some applause to this panel and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.